It's Acoustic Alternatives from Grove Studios in Ypsilanti, the home of the podcast since October of 2020. They were very kind and uh, gave me a home to do a podcast after I lost my radio gig. And their reasoning was, we want you to come in and, well, basically bring us money. It wasn't really what happened, but it brought me purpose. It reminded me that when I was doing the radio thing for 15 years in Ann Arbor, I got the pleasure to visit with a lot of folks. And even before that, when I was in Dearborn doing radio, I got to visit with a lot of folks. And one of those is here today at Grove Studios, Nips Landy, all the way from... Flushing, Michigan. Flushing, Michigan. Wow. Where I once met a, I once met a plumber's daughter from Flushing, Michigan, and I thought that was the funniest thing. Ironic. <laughs> we were kids then, and it was it was like, Flushing? Nah, that's funny. Anyway, that's where you live these days. Uh, although, today you took a little time off of work to spend some time with me. Jen Cass is an award-winning solo artist and member of the band The Lucky Nows, who are writing a brand new release, which I don't have in my hands because it's not out yet. But by the time this is here... By the time I drive home, <laughs> it, it could will be. be on my porch. Okay. There's a delivery notification that in my is, email. That is awesome. Yeah. The album's Super called Broken exciting. Homes at Hearts of Gold, and I have had the pleasure of hearing it before most of the world. And before I, all the world. <laughs> I, well, your band has heard it first. Your, your recording engineers Fair. have heard it. Your, your <laughs> person, mastering, mastering person. What's her name? Kim? I forget. Kim yes. Rosen, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, a few people have heard it, but I was able to with my honor, be the first to debut it on any kind of a radio station, though it was an internet radio station, but it still counts. It absolutely counts. Well, Jen's superpower is telling stories about the people in her lives and also bringing bad people to justice. That's another superpower. (laughs) Um, I would like, before we get into conversation, to hear one of the songs. I don't really know what four or three songs you decided to do, because we didn't actually discuss. Do you want to do three or four? We didn't. I wanted to surprise you. Oh, boo. Okay. I'm Um, surprised. No, I thought I would start with the the, uh, song that gives us the title of the CD. I love the song. Um, Do you want to tell the story or leave it be? I Can you tell the story? I don't think I can tell the story and sing the song. It just I get too emotional when I tell the story. I will just tell um, people that just pay attention and you'll yeah. figure the story out. It's, it's hard to miss if you're actually following the lyrics, but um, it's called Broken Homes and Hearts of Gold. When I knew you were coming, I never could sleep. If I tried, you would just kick the hell out of me. So I'd sit in your room painting purples and blues, singing songs to my belly and waiting for you with a love so big it could fill. Two days early, I wasn't surprised You were nine pounds of energy ready to fly And I gave you the name of my most trusted friend And I hope that be armor against every end In a world so big You fit in my hands And I held your days in a world you created with pirates and dragons and princesses waiting for nights or a spaceship to take them away and you lost yourself in every role that you played and the damn souls became their own heroes and the bad
People will tell you to be who you are Just as long as you don't try to take it too far They'll cut off your beautiful, colorful wings In their black and white world You're a dangerous thing Can't keep you safe And still let you go I can't make them see what I see Jen Cass of the Lucky Nows is my guest on Acoustic Alternatives from Grove Studios. The title track from the second Lucky Nows album, Broken Homes and Hearts of Gold, due out in June of 2024. Probable first appearance of the CD will be at the Nor'easter Festival or the Benefit the Day Before, probably. Probably the Benefit the Day Before, yeah, Thursday and night. That is in Saginaw? Wait. No, that one is up in Commons, Michigan. Commons, Michigan, with an I-N-S. Commons, Commons with an I-N-S. <laughs> where, where is that particular gig located? Uh, that's at Skyline Event Center. Okay, so people and go. We're sh- it's a split bill with a fantastic folk band called The Rough and Tumble. Oh, yeah. Are very good friends. They've been guests. Yes. They, they, were, they were guests when we were down the hall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we moved into this room and for the podcast studio. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. I know that yes. is a tough song. It's a tough, I mean, it's Woo. not, it's not my story and I get choked up, but it's the story of a lot of parents these days. In fact, I know my sister-in-law when I'm able to like properly send her, a, please listen to this at your leisure when you're allowed to cry because you're going to, because she understands your story with two kids having the yeah. same situation in her family. So this is this is a story you probably wouldn't have released 10 years ago, but today... Correct, yeah. I, I don't know that I would have felt um, comfortable sharing it, and I think what was really important to me is that it was okay with my child. Yeah, well, that's important. And it was okay with him, so... Yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to help people with the song. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to help people understand that they're not alone. That's To me, that's what music does best. It reminds me that somebody's been through what I've been through. It is. It becomes a. Um, it becomes sort of a big group um, therapy session yeah, kind of, yeah. at times, right? Um, and it's it's always been important to me that my songs are are true. They start from a kernel of truth. Uh, most of them are entirely true, start to finish, and um, it, it's how I've always written from that place of truth and honesty. And I think if you're connected to yourself in that way, then the stories you tell will connect with other people too. I always have connected with your songs, even though I know I'm not one of the characters, but I I, I feel your characters. Not yet. (laughs) Oh, oh. I will give you fodder later. There's so much time. (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you fodder later if you want to write a song with my life in it. All right. So let's back way up before you you started doing this. You grew up in the Detroit area, is that correct? I did. Yeah, I grew up in in and around uh, Detroit, uh, Livonia, Dearborn, a bunch of places down there. That's a good place to be, not far from where I grew up in Warren. Um, so the area uh, that you grew up in, just like me, has a rich musical community, too. I mean, we've always been around Motown and all the Absolutely. Uh, Seeger and whatever. There's a whole bunch of things that have come out of here. Uh, but was your family musical or just you? No, um, my dad is actually still a guitar player in a couple of different bands. He plays for um, contra dances. He plays in a big Irish band. Um, hmm. And he has always been a guitar player, so he would pull out the guitar and he would sing songs for us. And 
there's you know little audio tapes from way back when with our little tiny voices singing mm-hmm. along with dad playing you know Gordon Lightfoot songs or whatever struck his fancy that day sure yeah and he um, I really wanted to learn how to play guitar and my my mom was insistent that we all had to learn piano and that was what we had to do so I did my five years of piano never clicked at all I can play piano but it just never there's one behind you never clicked for me um, so I finally convinced them to to let me learn guitar and you know the rest just it it came so much more naturally for me and it is I'm so I feel much more connected to the guitar as an instrument and the things that come through the guitar as a writer are very much um you know it's a it's a collaboration between me and an instrument okay and you had siblings I do I have one sibling one sibling okay Uh, my sister Shannon and she plays piano Oh, okay she picked that right up I feel like in one of your songs you hinted a brother, but I don't know if it was a fictional brother or not. Might have been you. a fictional brother. I don't have a brother. Okay. But... Do you want one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm still Is it adoptable. Too late? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's too late. <laughs> Probably too late. Uh, <laughs> what high school did you graduate from? I went to Roper. Roper. So uh, yeah, Roper. You're my at the second time. Roper graduate, actually. Really? Yes. Who's the other one? Allison Albrecht. Okay. Do you yeah. Know her at absolutely. All? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so Roper is a really interesting um, place with a philosophy that encourages you to engage in things that change the world, whether it be through art or through the work that you do in your in your day job. Or if you combine the two, they they really work uh, hard with people to find a path that gives them the opportunity to make a difference in the world and to instigate change. And so Roper students all over the place. you know, they, they come off a lot like me. They do a lot of things in a lot of different directions to try to make the world better. So none of your fellow graduates would be surprised at the two things that you do for a living. No, and then you add to that that I'm, you know, a martial arts person. That's so, right. Yeah. I've, you could I've, kick my ass. I might. Why? <laughs> but just I've always watch been it, nice to fella. you. <laughs> I've always been nice to you. Anyway. Uh, no, the, the rule number one of karate is you never use it except in self-defense. So, oh, and, oh, well. You so you're good. You won't need that. You're good. <laughs> well, you grew up listening pretty much to the same radio stations I did I probably did. as a kid. What what role did radio play in your life? Radio was huge. I, I remember my dad getting an old Panasonic um, cassette player that had, for the first time ever, had a record button. And I would hold the Panasonic um, record <laughs> little cassette recorder up to the radio Um, and I would get Casey Kasem's American Top 40 every week. I scheduled my life around that. Of course I did yeah and I would I would actually in addition to recording it I would write out um, all the songs and I would watch the way they were moving and I would try to decide why they were moving that way and what made a good song and um, yeah it was it was huge. I spent almost all of my life with my you know head and headphones or up next to a stereo I would my parents had the the kind of stereo that's furniture. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So we'd put on records and you'd sit with your back against one of the speakers and <laughs> and it was a religious experience to get a new record where you had lyrics on the inside and you'd sit with your back against so you could feel the music going through you yeah. and you would read the lyrics and and learn the songs that way. You painted that picture so well. Yeah, it was That's great. Huge. I, I remember that. It. Yeah, I mean we did similarly yeah. did that. Um you, uh, again, radio is a part of your life in probably the same way I, I listened to it and observed it, but you turned it into, I want to write songs. What age were you when you said, hey, I want to do that? Well, it's really interesting. I was kind of a late bloomer to songwriting. Oh. I was an early bloomer to poetry. Ah, okay. So, Me too, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. I wrote I, poems when my heart was broken. I wrote a lot broken. of poems. <laughs> yeah. And I, I read a lot and I, I, lost myself in these worlds that were created by other writers and I admired people's ability to to you know actually tell a story with that I could see and visualize with just words on a piece of paper I thought it was incredible so I eventually I um I think you know I got toward um probably my junior year in college and I was at University of Michigan and the ARC open mics were also a thing that I went to every single week but I wasn't playing I was just there to see Enjoy. what was happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it was at the time it was Carl Cacho and and uh, Katie Curtis and David Goldfinger and um, gosh, there were just some great players. Joe Sarah Pair was there. Mm-hmm. Um, just Chris Buhalis. I could go on and on. There were so many people that showed up for that, and I was just in awe of these incredible writers and players. And I went home and decided, you know, next week I'm going to play. And the deal was you had to play two songs, and the goal was that they be original. 
And so I had to write two songs in one week to be able to do it. And I pulled it off. <laughs> two old poems or two brand new things? Oh, no, they're, they were brand new things. So I wrote um, Train Song and House of Cards, both of which made it onto my, my very first debut CD okay. um, in one week. And then I went and played them. Wow. And that became a goal for me that I would go and I would try to play two new songs every Wednesday. Which for songwriters out there, and I'm not really a prolific uh, write all the time sort of writer. I, you know, when something strikes me, I notice that. Yeah, <laughs> you notice the gaps in my recordings. Kind of, yeah. Some something will strike me, and then I'll go on a streak. Oh, okay. Um, and at that time, I was writing, you know, two two songs a week was. Mm. Now, not all of them made the records and not all of them were, um, you know, tremendous material, but it, it's really important as a songwriter to continue to write um, and to dig a little deeper and try a little harder and try to have every song sound a little different. And it was a great exercise. And to do that and stand up in front of people who I really admired and who I still really admire um, was absolutely formational i would not be the writer that i am today without those people i wouldn't be the player i am today tom paxton i, I mm. met tom paxton uh when i was very very young in my career and he pulled me aside after my show i had opened and he pulled me aside and said you're a great writer you got to be a better guitar player mm. that was nice 20 honesty. years ago now but i loved the honesty yeah. and then i set about to do it i was all right then i'm going to do that if that's what i need to do i'm going to do it um so i i really appreciate all the you know, the love and support and advice I've gotten from, um, you know, more seasoned musicians over the years. And I've tried to take it all to heart. That's great. Well, you were doing that. You're going to law school, which I'm sure took a, a <laughs> fair was. amount of brain power. Uh, that's not a, a easy school to pass through, but you know. You're... No, no. And I was doing that at University of Michigan too. So that was, yeah. you know, that was a very high pressure situation. But what gave me the ability to finish that was that I also had music on the side. So um, a release of sorts. Yeah. Something. Yeah, to like... it was something that gave me, you know, what was happening in my heart was still able to get out there. It wasn't all. It wasn't all a cerebral exercise every day and Socratic method and stand and deliver. It was, you know, I was still feeling my feelings and I was still, I still had a place to put them, and I think that kept kept me whole and it kept me healthy um, through those years that were they were really hard years. Um, but interestingly, that's when I put out my first CD is in law school. I have it as 28 years ago. Is that about right? That's about right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty that's long That's scary, career. but yeah, that's true. Well, that was the album called Brave Enough to Say. You were working your day job in the field or just schooling when that album I came was, out? That one was I was in the middle of law school. Okay, so you're actually still out. learning, not actually practicing yeah. anything. Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, that was a good start. It got people's attention, right? There was <laughs> there was some uh, you know some traction out there. Yeah. Uh, however, it was your second album, "Skies Burning Red," that seemed to get a little bit more attention across the country, even Absolutely. I think in Canada too, right? Yeah, I, it actually got radio play all over the world, and um, I had award nominations, and um, I was lucky enough with "Brave Enough to Say" to get the attention of John Jennings. And John Jennings, for those who didn't immediately recognize him, was. Uh, a longtime friend and producer of Mary Chapin Carpenter, um, worked with the Indigo Girls, Iris Dement, uh, just a lot of really good, you it's know. It's a nice resume. Really good resume, absolutely. And he was gracious enough. I asked him if he would listen to my music, and I wanted to do a new CD. And he said, sure, send me your first record. And I sent it. And he said, all right, send me your new songs. And I sent them. <laughs> and then he said, all right, let's make a record. And uh, that record, Skies Burning Red, is, is still, I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of the work we did with that record. I think the songs are great. I think everything about the arrangement and uh, the production is fantastic. And I worked with Mary Chapin Carpenter's band, and um, they all got to be my friends. And it mm. was, it was, I really thought at that point that that's what it was going to, I was going to break as an artist, and I was going to be moving to Nashville, and I was going to be touring and I just I really thought that was going to get me right over the edge and I did get a lot of really really good opportunities because of that record that was the same year I'm, I was looking at kind of like chronologically what happened around the same time uh, Dar <laughs> Williams breakthrough record Moral City was the same year Jonathan Brooke was quite, kind of right in between when she was breaking yes. out now had you taken fire caught fire excuse me yeah. taken fire at the same time with them mm -hmm. I mean, did you did you see yourself derailing from the law school career choice? Or oh yeah. Would, would you have just kind of absolutely? Went, well, that's I can always yeah. go back to that. Yeah. Um. When I in '99, uh, I got the Indie Girl tour, and I went out with you know just some incredible female artists, and we went all over the country and played. And um, you know, there's there have been many points in my career where I thought this is I'm going to make the leap over to to nothing but music, and 
it, it always was just, just there, mm. just there. But what was clear to me is that I still had things to say and I still had things I wanted to write. And I had, you know, I always played, I always played, I always played live. I always wrote, um, I always put out another record. It's just like you've noticed because I'm not a prolific writer. It's okay. It's uh, worth know, it the just, wait. It, I write a lot of songs, but I don't write a lot of songs that I want to record. <laughs> <laughs> so I have I have a catalog in in a in a trunk at home that is you know probably 40 50 songs that I never recorded mm. um, and sometimes I go back and revisit them and and some of them still pop into my head I'll be you know just wandering about my daily life and all of a sudden a song comes into my head that I wrote in you know 1996 or 1997 and I usually take that as a sign that it's time to pull it out and see if it has something more to say that's pretty cool I, I mean, I never wrote a song properly, but I wrote, like I said, lyrics when I was a kid and I had a crush on a girl between seventh and ninth grade. And I actually remember most of the lyrics to that song and a little bit of a melody I could created. Like I, it's never been a song ever. That's the beautiful <laughs> thing about music and music and words mesh together, though, is it does yeah. create an indelible memory and you can access that. There are things that and I'm sure this happens to you, too, but a song will come on. That I haven't heard in years and years, and I'm in. I'm at a place. Triggers, right? It takes you right totally. to, you know, my friend Michelle's yeah. house where we were having a sleepover party, and that song came on the radio, or we were waiting for the DJ to play it. You know, finally did. You know, there's so much about your life that is kind of embedded in those songs that become a part of who you are, and I'm really thankful to have loved music that way see this yeah. chokes me up to talk about music this way but to love music that much and to be able to do it um yeah. as part of what i do for a living is what a blessing. just an incredible gift yeah, yeah. it's That's incredible good. gift when i hear anything from simon garfunkel's greatest hit simon the white chrysler LeBaron with my mom <laughs> with the a-track player playing that or john yeah. denver's greatest hit same thing Absolutely. like anything from that is like i'm sitting next to mom or i'm in the back seat i mean that's yeah. that's where it takes me i totally get it and you're and those you're there's a feeling associated with it yeah. too like yeah. you are you are in the safe place and yeah. you are happy and yeah. like it's it's amazing what it can do those harmonies of simon garfunkel <clears throat> Something sparked in me when I heard Indigo Girls, mm -hmm. and it was actually Land of Canaan that really triggered it for yeah. me, not Closer to Vine, which was probably on the radio, but I wasn't hearing it. Right. And that's kind of where my music taste went from pop rock kid to, whoa, what is this world? Absolutely. Like kind of upside down, like, woo, and this is the world that I, yeah, yeah. I'm happiest in. I like all of the musical worlds because sure. music really is my passion, but like this, that was the turning point for me. It was an Indigo Girls record. So yeah. I mean, the, that, that record changed everything. Yeah. It changed everything for everyone, I think. Um, I remember hearing that and I remember running to school kids records to get it like <laughs> right, right then, like whatever that is, I have to have it right now yeah. and being just immersed in it for a long, long time. And that actually is why I started to play guitar again was oh. that record. Um, I'm glad I, said I that went then. and took, <laughs> um, I went and took, uh, lessons at Herb David guitars yeah, in Ann Arbor and I, I probably only took four or five lessons, but I just, I wanted to learn how to play those songs. And I, at the time, didn't have the ability to sit down and figure it out myself. I can do that now. But back then, it was like, I don't know what they're doing. They're doing something amazing. Yeah, but boom. turns out they were doing things that I could play, too. Very cool. And that was, um, that was really eye-opening. And I, I waited and waited for every record they put out since then. I still, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I'm, I'm, nobody's voice really stays <clears throat> forever as good. But uh, I'm a little sad that Emily's voice has kind of fallen off a bit. And that's, uh, that's going to happen, right? Yeah. Very few voices gonna, age gracefully. It's going to happen to all of us. Yeah. And, you know, I think what the, I'm the youngest person in my band. <laughs> yeah, and I guess you are. I am the youngest person in my band and I am, I am fortunate to play with just absolute world-class players. They're, you know, all three of these guys are phenomenal. And I am holding on to every moment of it because I know that it will not last forever. We sure. it can't possibly last forever. It's and splinter up. A little yeah, bit. I mean, we're just we're not. You know, I'm not 22 anymore, and they are what? even older what? than me. What? <laughs> so we're we're just going to try to enjoy it as as long as we possibly can. And it's just a. It is absolutely been one of the greatest experiences of my musical career to be able to work with. Mike Robertson and Roscoe Sully and my sweet husband, Eric. And, you know, this record, we picked up Ozzy Andrews and we picked up um, Lauren Krantz. Oh, cool. so, and and there, was this, there was this little fellow named Dom Davis who oh. came in and played five tracks of no bass way. for us as well. So Dom's on there for five nice. tracks, which was, you know, an incredible honor to have him play. But yeah. um, 
I got to tell you, everybody who touched this record added just magic. It's, and I, I'm so looking forward to it getting out there to more people because I think we have a lot to say with this record. This would be a good time to say another thing from the record. Would it now? <laughs> it would be. What All right, then. from the forthcoming album, um, Broken okay. Homes and Hearts of Gold, from the Lucky Nows, the second release from the band. What one would you feel comfortable playing? I right will, now? you know, because we're doing all the ones that are hard for me to sing. Because it's, oh, yes. it's a good exercise uh, for me. You got to do it in front of public. Uh, if you want to sell records, you have to play these songs. Right? I mean, that's reality. <laughs> well, and that's that's part of what you know. My my band, my sweet band members, are always encouraging me because. Um, I connect with my writing, like d like I said, it's like a direct to the heart experience, and that sometimes makes it hard to sing it live. Um, so this one, I'm getting better at singing live. Um, I've lived with it a little bit longer. This is this is Syracuse. Um, in Dearborn, Michigan, there's a little street called Syracuse that is off of basically Telegraph and Cherry Hill, where the old Oxford High School used to stand, and that is the neighborhood where. My grandparents had their house. See, I'm already crying. Um, they bought it on a land contract in 1945 when my grandpa got home from the war. And everything that ever happened in my life was witnessed by that house. Like that, that place became its own living creature, in a, a character in my life. So when my, I, we lost my grandma. And then um, a couple years later, we lost my grandpa. And then we sold the house. And so this tells the story of them, which they were hugely important in my life, but it also kind of, the, the house is a character. Yeah. I'm going to pull it together, I swear. <laughs> um, I'm here for you. I appreciate it. See, we're, gonna, we're holding hands <laughs> for those just listening wherever, <laughs> having a moment because yeah. I need to pull it together. Um, but I, I mean, it, it is inevitable in your life that the, the, um, the older people of your life, you, you know, they grow older and then they're gone. And I'm just really, I, I miss him still every day. So. Gentlest of giants, you were the stories that you told. Even when you were lying, we knew the truth. How you joined the Navy and fought that war, and you married her, like you said, before you left, you would. It was 1945 On a fireman's pay Bought a red brick house And some pale pink paint And you rolled it out there on the walls That would witness all our lives On Syracuse
And you didn't know who I was some days But you held my hand and you asked my name a thousand times And I told you all I knew A tire swing on a willow tree And the stilts you built and the peonies Your sweetie loved all the time that So the gentlest of giants, every story that he told Faded into the silence, so I drove I watched the sun go down on that red brick house With the pale pink paint you and Graham picked out still on the walls but everything had changed I blinked my lights as I drove away And I wish like hell you were there to wave Just one last time, one last time, one last time Standout cut from the new album from The Lucky Nows, due out in June of 2024. The album Broken Homes and Hearts of Gold, the track Syracuse, my guest from the band Jen Cass, is here today at Grove Studios. Thank you for getting through that. I know sometimes Woo! that can be hard. Yeah. You know, I think that it's um, it's important for me to sing that song. Uh, my, my grandpa had a motto that he lived by, and it was, never let the, tr the truth stand in the way of a good story. He said it all the time. Never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> um, but when I wrote this, I really wanted it to be the truth. And that's I, I put that in that very opening line of it. You know, you were the gent gentlest of giants. Every story that you told, there, there, those stories keep coming through. And even when you were lying, we knew the truth, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. Um, he, was, he was a glorious human being. And I loved him dearly. And just to be able to get, you know, to the point now where I can usually play that song without you know catastrophe befalling me is fantastic because it is it's very emotional um it's it's made more so by the fact that we really didn't have a chance to say goodbye to him because he died he was one of the first mm. first folks around here who died from covid oh. and so there was no there wasn't even the ability to gather and celebrate him we just sorry, he was just gone i'm sorry so Take an emotional break. I want, I'm, I'm going to thank Grove Studios while you gather yourself. Grove Studios is where we are today. Ypsilanti, Michigan is the home of Grove Studios, just uh, just east of Ann Arbor, a little west of Detroit. If you're in a band, actually younger Eric and younger Michael probably would have loved jamming in here because it's really made for like, the, the motto is get out of the garage, get into the studio. Oh, yeah. So you can make a lot of noise. You're next to a drum set. There's yeah. big speakers around here. There's five rooms in this building. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're in the largest room. The deluxe room is the the room that if you really want to do some major work, do it in here. If you have a smaller ensemble, right across the hall, there's one about half the size. There's a spot for DJs to practice their, their mixing skills over awesome. there. Right next to us is a room where you can kind of, it's probably made for doing like your, your mastering and your mixing so you can play it loud through speakers. It's not necessarily for performing, but it's got a space where you can crank it and hear what it sounds like. Awesome. And then another smaller performance space uh, that you can use. So lots of spaces in the building in Ypsilanti. Grove Studios is where we're at again. They've been the... The price of these, where are we at? 76 podcasts. They are the ones that have hosted uh, most of them. I think I've been on the road a couple of times at other people's homes or wherever we might have been. Uh, but today we're 
thankfully back in Grove Studios with Jen Cass of the Lucky Nows. We were talking a little bit before you went into that second song about the momentum of your career, and momentum number three was the third album, the only one in my collection that's not signed, apparently. Oh, I'll have uh, to sign that I before I leave. <laughs> Accidental, Pil <coughs> Accidental Pilgrim actually did, I think, better, from what I remember, than the second did, album. yeah. So we the, have five singles that charted off that, and uh, Dear Mr. President off that record was the number 24, 25 song, folk song of the year. Wow. Well, that was 18 years ago, and then there was a bit of a gap. Yeah, then there were all those kids. Those yeah. kids popped out. You want to talk about what happened in that 18-year yeah. gap? So, um, so, yeah, I got married, and I had two kids, and then I got divorced, and then I had, and I got married again, and that sweet, lovely man that I married, Mr. Eric Janetsky, who is the, one of the lead guitar players at the Lucky Nows, um, had three, three kids of his own. So our oldest, when we got together, was uh, 12 or 13, and our youngest was 5 or 6, and... It was uh, pretty much, you know, that was that was what we did for many years. We raised those kids and we tried to weave them together into a cohesive family. When that's that's kind of a hard thing to do at times. But Brady Bunch said it wasn't. All all five of these kids are are great and they are good friends now. Um, so it was every bit of time uh, and effort and love that we poured into that was worth it. It was, it's it's been a really fantastic life yeah. <laughs> it's been great i'm happy to see you happy i've known you a long time yeah. and uh, I, I i see the two of you together and i see how you love each other and you are absolutely one of my favorite couples so <laughs> I, I i say that from from the heart and we we <clears throat> are very aware of how fortunate we are because i think a lot of people do find someone to spend their life with but not everybody finds true love you know and yeah. it's it's glorious. <laughs> it's really glorious. And even when it's hard, you know, there are times when it's hard, but um, we have never had a fight. Wow. Eric and I have not fought once in our entire marriage because we just connect on a really deep level and we understand each other and we love each other and we're careful with our words and we're kind with our words. And, you know, it, it makes for a pretty great place to come home to and to create. And, you know, we've, we've come up with some pretty great stuff together. He's probably afraid of you, too, because you're a black belt. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to piss her he, off. He is the person, in, other than my, my son, Red, who does karate with me. Yeah, you know, so. Eric is the person who most often gets the phrase, come here, I want to show you something I learned in karate. No, <laughs> so. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping that way, thanks anyway. So the, the Lucky Nows originally started out as a duo, the, just the two of you. How did yeah. that evolve into a band? Yeah, so um, we initially were, were just playing out, the two of us, because we both just wanted to play mm -hmm. songs together. And along the way, we met um, some people who were great side people. And so we, we would have people come in and we would and people would go out and that would go on for a while. And then we were um, getting ready to record and we wanted to play the arc in uh, in celebration of the, the record that we were putting out. And we thought, you know, it's time to get serious about who is in this band. Mm -hmm. And so we asked Mike Robertson, and Michael Robertson, for you know those who don't know, is is an incredible singer songwriter in his own right. Um, great guitar he's player. A great guitar player, and he's sought after as a guitar player as a sideman. But I think people often don't know how good a writer he is and how careful he is with the way that he crafts a song. So he's he's one of you know obviously Eric, but um, Mike is one of the first people I send a new song to. Mm. Kyle Rashi, I send my songs to Kyle. Kyle nice. sends his back to me. We have a little thing going That's back you. and forth. Also um, a previous guest. Yeah, but it's it's really lovely to have you know such talented people to surround yourself with. So we bring Mike into the fold, and we were talking on Facebook about how we were going to play the Ark, and it's, it was going to be amazing, and we were promoting, and Roscoe Sally, who's a world-class uh, undisputedly world-class harmonica player gets on the thread on facebook and says i want to play the arc and i so i i reach out to roscoe and said do you seriously want to play the arc because we'd be really honored to have you join us and he was like i absolutely do so roscoe came and played the first time he played with us was at the arc wow and then we re finished no recording Roscoe gets all over everything. And, you know, the lucky now is in, in the current incarnation, these four people, Michael Robertson, Roscoe Selly, Eric Janetsky, and myself, you know, that's the core of the lucky now is now. Uh, John Patrikas with, with, was with us for many years. Um, I have the utmost respect for his abilities. He's incredible. Um, he got married and moved. Yeah, well, that'll do something to <laughs> um, it, Dan, we for a while had a, a great mandolin player, too, who moved to South Carolina. So okay. we've, we've lost some people along the way, but those four have stayed as the core of the lucky nows and then there are, are people who come and go yeah. um along the way 
So. Do you ever cover the song that you named the band after? <laughs> you know, Eric and I used to play it. That's one of the one of the first weekends we went away. Um, we, when we were first dating, we went away for the weekend. And as we were driving up to Cadillac, we were playing each other music that, you know, mattered to us. And so I was like, you got to hear Jeffrey Focal. And he was like, oh, I got this Ryan Adams song that you're going to love. And we went back and forth with it. And it was that record that had the luck, that track on it Lucky had just man. come out. Yeah. And so we listened to that on the way up to the cottage and it became, you know, sort of an, a, an anthem for us. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Unfortunately, he had a bit of a he did yeah a yes. thing with his <laughs> career. And Unfortunately, I have yeah. seen him since, and I was like, all right, I'm going to give you another chance to mm-hmm. to be okay. And yeah. I enjoyed the show, but in the back of my head, I'm still like kind of a dick. But all right, it's anyway. gonna it's forever going to change people's perception of him because there. You know, I don't think that anybody doubts that Phoebe Bridgers is telling it the way that it happened. I don't think anybody doubts the stories. Um, Andy Moore. So too. he just yeah. and and anymore, you it's hard to survive that kind of um, behavior feel bad and also don't feel bad don't be a dick if you're going to be sure. a public figure or don't be a dick period right. <laughs> and, right and then you know and if you're going to be a public figure and be a dick yeah. expect you're going to be caught yeah eventually. i mean that, right so i mean just but. he had he has such a great catalog i hate to dismiss does, it yeah. i can't dismiss it because i still respect yeah. what he did so it's like right. uh, well and if we i think if we all just threw away every artist that we ever <laughs> admired or loved because of you know bad behavior we wouldn't have anybody left to listen to probably not or, or, you know, anybody left to who's, who's art you wanted to view or who's, you know, it's, we're all flawed. We are all troubled yep. in our own ways. And, you know, some of us are, are unfortunately have made choices that hurt other people. And th- that's kind of where the line is harder to yeah. get over. Well, the Lucky Nows have a web page. It's theluckynows.com, but there's no Facebook page. There's no like separate. Right. Pa- what? What is that? All well, about? you know, there is going to be a Facebook okay, page. Okay, you we, should. We probably. took um, we took everything down when we were redesigning for this oh. new CD. Okay. Um, and everything will go back up. The there's a placeholder website up there right now, and basically the main thing on it is our schedule. So if you want to know where we're playing, that's up there at theluckynows.com. But the rest of the content is going to come at the same time as the CD is released, which is really soon now. It's it comes out May 31st officially. Yeah. yeah when I went to the website the other day, I clicked on it expecting to find I'm like, well, it's a blank page. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So where can I get more information? And I know you, but I'm like yeah. when I when I do these things, I always do a bit of like Absolutely. what's been going on recently that I might have missed. I can yeah. talk about that too. Yeah. I wanna, make sure we get all the important things in. like i went back and listened to sessions that you and i did at oh, whfr fun yeah. i will i will off the microphone and tell you something about one of those or two <laughs> of those actually but i rem- it, it remembered remembered it reminded me that 20 years ago you had a losing accident and broke your thumb i sure did and i forgot all about that yes. and i wondered if it had any effect on i know you obviously at the time you had to change how you played guitar but did it yeah. change your guitar playing permanently or just temporarily is the question i did a lot i had really good physical therapists that i worked with because it it was it was definitely changing the way that I was playing, um, and I I finger pick and strum, and I was able to you know gerrymander this thing where I put the, <laughs> you know it was it was just a very strange thing, but um, in order to play guitar well, you've got to be able to push pretty hard on on the neck of the guitar to get a chord to ring mm-hmm. correctly, and I couldn't do that for a long time, so I'm thankful to the nice physical therapist who worked with me to get that strength back so I could play again, um, mm-hmm. but it was it was uh, yeah that was a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> well, you've been at it for don't uh, don't stick your th- hand out when losing. Yeah, I've never. They loosed. actually tell you that they're like, oh. don't stick your hand out, and I was like, cool. And what did I do? Stuck, stuck my hand, hand out. out. Instincts. That's why they, <laughs> so they tell you not to do it. So far in your twenty eight ish years, what have been the biggest gigs that you've played? The one like the big stages, or the like, yeah. oh my god, I can't believe I got to do this. Ah, uh, wow. You know, I there, there's one that always stands out in my mind. Um, I mean, obviously Wheatland always stands out in your mind every time you get a chance to take the stage at Wheatland. Is is a stunning um the arc is my home um they gave me my first chances and my first breaks and um, the Siglin family has been incredibly kind to me over many years um so the arc stands out but i gotta tell you i got to play the boston folk festival and you know as a student of folk music in addition to you know a person who plays folk music that that is a place i always really wanted to play mm. And I was able to get um, a two-song set, sort of an emerging artist set, at the Boston Folk Festival. And then I had a baby. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to play the Boston Folk Festival. I don't care. I know that this this was uh, Juno, my, my daughter, and she was in a baby Bjorn. She was really little. She was probably only a month or two old when I played it. 
And I got there and I, I didn't even know what to do, like s- strap the baby on my back and keep playing. I wasn't sure. But fortunately, Lori McKenna was there. <laughs> like she, she floated down like an angel and said, I will hold your baby while you play your set. And um, to me the baby. it was, it was great. You know, I, I loved that gig, not only because, you know, it was the Boston Folk Festival and I got to play Dear Mr. President at a time when, you know, that song was really big, but because Lori McKenna was holding my baby. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and nicely that you mentioned Dear Mr. President, because my next listed question is, is there a, well, it seems like there'd be weird ways to phrase that, but I'm almost going to say, is there a reason to update the song? Because there is probably, but would you be tempted to update the song? I guess is probably that is such way. a good question. And, and I, I guess my answer to that would be in a way I did update the song when I wrote good night. Oh, so, um, there are things just like Phil Oaks has, um, here's to the state of Mississippi. And he later updated that and it became here's to the state of Richard Nixon. And it was a kind of an evolving <laughs> song because of that. And so, Dear Mr. President could definitely do that. It remains relevant. I wish it weren't, but it does absolutely remain relevant that there are wars being fought all over the world and soldiers who are fighting them who have no idea why they're fighting and uh, have the right to ask those questions. And that's why I wrote that song, to try to give voice to, it was was the Iraq War that was happening then, but um, I was trying to give voice to some people who were writing to me saying, your music is giving me comfort out here and what do you know about what's happening? What are you hearing about what's happening? And those conversations sparked that song. And so it helped people and it also pissed people off. Both. Yeah. Well, you know, Dear Mr. President got me steamrolled with the Dixie nice. Chicks and kicked right out of Nashville. So High five. It was <laughs> Across the room. Oh, nice nice um, job. Yeah. I was one of the band artists for, for, I wasn't big enough to have it be, you know, national news no, that I was being steamrolled with the yeah. Dixie Chicks, but I was. I was, you know, thrown right under with, with them. And um, I, I, couldn't be in better company that's people, you know me and steve Earl and the dixie chicks and we all just got you know run out of town but unfortunately my career was at a place where i was just about to break uh-huh yeah and then you know, that was kind bit. of a, yeah. a reason why i did not because i was viewed by nashville at that point to be sort of a pariah oh. i was telling stories they didn't want to hear just then does it still make it to the sets these days the song like when you do um, when I play solo, which I don't do very often anymore, no. but when I play solo, it still makes the sets. Um, and when I play at the Ark on the 25th of July. July yes, that's in um, the later portion. Yeah, of the yeah. well, too. we'll mention that later, but oh, okay. when I, pl- I will play it. I've been looking forward to playing it again. Okay. And Lucky Now gigs are pretty much all like songs from the two records now. And do you yeah, include solo there, songs from? There are some solo songs that make it through. Um, Trouble which is off Skies Burning Red, is a consistent song that we play. Uh, Even Angels gets played a lot. Roscoe added something just extraordinary to that song, and I really want to re-record it because mm. it's it's different now, and Again. it's just beautiful, and, and I think we will probably with the next CD. We do sometimes do um, Small Town Boys, so there are some some songs that we do. Makes we sense. play Pirate. Um, but, yeah, we, we do try to focus. The, the beautiful thing about the Lucky Nows is that all – four of us are singer songwriters in our own right. So it's like, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young or the Eagles or, you know, one of the great old bands that we grew up, you know, with our back against the stereo listening to, of course, yeah. um, you know, those harmonies sure. and, and that each of them had their own way of writing and their own voice and their own style. And we have that too. We have every single person in this band writes and every single person in this band wrote at least one song and sings as the lead singer, at least one song. Um, for these records and, and the, that's pretty cool then the semi-official release party for the for the disc is the nor'easter music festival wet saturday stage or the day before we're still trying to design two days yeah before. i mean we'll i'm sure we'll play some of the new songs at the at the nor'easter kickoff concert at skyline event center but the set that we put together for nor'easter is almost entirely the new material yes. so it's a chance for people to hear almost all of those songs live and some of them for the first time we'll be playing them live for the first time cool do you want to do another one now? It's <laughs> a good lead in. Do I? Yeah. Shall you? Let's, will you? I will. Um, so this this is called The Lesson. And it's one of very few songs that we actually, as a band, sat around a table and wrote together. Hmm. Um, Roscoe was unable to join us that day, but he oh. later added beautiful stuff to it. But uh, Eric and Mike and I sat around a table and wrote the song together. And I... Largely, I am a solo writer. Um, Eric and I have learned 
ways to, you know, help each other write. Um, he adds incredible music to the things that I write and I help him kind of straighten lyrics out so they fit rhythmically with what he's envisioning. Um, but for all of us to sit around, uh, doesn't happen very often. I think this actually has my favorite lyric on the record. I'm glad you're playing it. Ah, well, you'll have to tell me what it is. (laughs) Later. Okay. So the lesson. Jen Cass from The Lucky Now is doing a track from their new record, Broken Homes and Hearts of Gold. That one is called The Lesson, which, as I mentioned before the song was played, has one of my favorite lyrics on the record. Care to guess which one it is? Um, if you'd watched my face, you would have is noticed. It, is it The Bullet Takes Its Flight mm, Line? No, that's a good one, but that's yeah. not it. No, what is it? Our fathers taught us right from wrong, but our mothers loved us wrong, wrong and right. right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway. That's from the forthcoming record. Uh, I'm honored to, to have uh, Jen Cass here in Grove Studios in Ypsilanti, where the podcast gets recorded on a pretty regular basis these days. Not necessarily on any regular schedule, but uh, it is one of the joys of my life, and I'm I'm glad that we're finding time to do this. This was difficult for us to find a time to schedule, so I want to ask, how do you find time to write music in your busy life? Because you're busy fighting crime and yeah, and yeah, I got to fight crime and you know use the karate skills to throw people around. Um, the it finds me. 
I guess that's my best answer. Driving to work, it hits you. Yeah, I mean, in some the shower, of, it hits some you? of the some of the best songs that I've ever written were, you know, I was I was in the shower and boom, Balancing Man came out in its entirety. I was on my way to work in Ann Arbor, hit a traffic jam, shocking, hmm. and um, somebody the entire song, but for one verse, the entire song came flying out in the middle of a traffic jam. <laughs> Um, and I'm singing into my phone to try to make sure I don't lose it. And I have all kinds of voice memos on my phone that I have to go through uh, and see what's usable or what, you know, what I want to say. And then, you know, there are other times when I, I wake up, I'm, I am sleeping and I wake up in the middle of the night and I've got a whole thing. And I've learned over the years that if I don't get up right then and try to capture it, it's gone. I will not have it in the morning. So I think that you have to learn to, um, you know, when the muse shows up, you you best get up and make sure you're listening. Well, if I'm doing my math right, there are five to six other humans in the house, depending on if there are at so school. Many. <laughs> um, that do, how do you not wake them up? Like, how do you not disturb people while you're writing music? Because it's, I mean, I've been to your house for yeah, one of your yeah. house concerts, but yeah. Well, I, um, the kids are all upstairs. Oh, okay. So the only person that I would wake up is my sweet, sweet Eric, Eric, and yes. he's he's been very. Um, he would want to be woken up by that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I he would. would. Most of the time, he wants to come out and play. Yeah. You know, um, and I and if you're listening, my darling, I'm sorry that I don't always let you. Sometimes when I'm sometimes when I'm working on a song, I'm not ready to even say it out loud to yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, he'd be the first person I shared anything with, but I'm just not ready to say it out loud yet. Um, and he is always so excited to hear the next thing. Um, so sometimes we have like this moment where I'm like, I'm not ready. And he goes, but I want to, you know, but, yeah. Close, the closest thing you get to fighting. <laughs> Let me hear the damn song. No, I'm not ready. No. Uh, I learned about something in the research that I didn't know about you. That you had some association with the Tufa novels, which I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Uh, did that result in any sort of uptick in your fan base? People discovering yeah, you through that? Tell me more sure. about that. Yeah. So. Years ago, um, there's an author by the name of Alex Bledsoe, who's one of my very favorite people in the world and has become a dear friend, and his wife, Valette, is a dear friend. They're the whole family. I love them. Um, just kind of cold emailed me out of nowhere and said, I'm writing a, a book, a novel, that has a female character that plays guitar. And I don't know what kind of guitar she'd play. And so I'm wondering if you'd read the book and tell me what kind of guitar you think she'd play. And I was like, that's awesome and weird and I love it please send me this book right away <laughs> so he sent me uh, a book called a wisp of a thing it was the first thing I ever read from Alex and it was wonderful it was just it's a wonderful book everyone should read it and so I I decided that this character because of things I will sh I shall not reveal would would play a, a breed love and I have reasons for that and you can fight me on it you can read the novel and fight me on it but I thought that's what she'd play um so we continued to be friends for years and years, and eventually he um, had a, another book in that same series, in the Tufa series, that had a pivotal moment where another person stood up and sang a song, and it was another female character. He writes amazing, strong female characters. So this woman stood up and played a song that basically revealed the greatest secret of this book, like this huge, giant secret that had been kept, and he was putting in placeholder words and it was like la 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 you know like could, could not for the life of him he's like I'm a writer why can't I do this you know so he called me and Eric and said can you take a crack at this yeah. and um and so the song that came out of that was was on the last record and that's against the black um and it's it's great fun to write in that way I'd love to do that some more um, to be given some parameters of you know what this character is about to do or what this this pivotal moment in a movie I, I just I think that that's a really fun challenge yeah well the new record is seemingly full of songs that are very personal very family oriented very much that so. last record I mean that song about the ghost was really great uh, and, and this one is so like I almost feel like as we discussed earlier how do you even sing these songs in public I, I don't know how you can do it they're great songs I'm 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 relating to them maybe because I know you yeah. But I think other people will relate to them, too, especially the first one you play, because there are a lot of other mothers going yeah. through what you describe in the song. So as a songwriter and a singer, you focused on your life more for this record. Yeah. Is that on purpose or is the, these are just you felt like the best contributions you could make to the record? I think that it was it's just where we are right now. You know, we're all of us, all four of us are at a point where we've had some um, 
great successes and some great tragedies in our lives and some really difficult things to overcome and some incredible things to just sail through and enjoy. And in the midst of that, you know, kind of churning sea of crazy that we've been living, um, you know, there's this kernel of honesty about who we are as people. And I think we all really reach deep to try to tell those honest stories again, you know, but, but you're right. I mean, I, I used to write songs in the very beginning when I was a brand new baby Jen cast singer songwriter, <laughs> I would write things that were very much like very personal and very hard to get through. And one of the things I learned is I have a hard time singing these songs and maybe I shouldn't write songs like that. Well, then I wrote Cannonball Girl, <laughs> um, which is about my daughter Juno. And it has become a big, it's a big song for yeah. the Lucky Nows. Yeah, I love that and um, I have to play it. You know, we it's greatest hits. I have to play it. It's it's one of the greatest hits for sure. And so it's it's one of the things that people expect to hear when they come to see us. Sure. And so I had to learn how to sing songs that were killing me. Um and I, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. You you have seen. I mean, it's they're very emotional for me here with just yeah. you who yeah. I trust immensely, you know, enough that I gave you the record before any other human that wasn't actually on the record, you know. Thank you. Um so I'm in a safe, safe place here with someone who knows me and gets me and understands me and knows what these songs are about. And it's still like brutal sometimes to sing them out loud, you know. But I'm gonna do it because I think one of the things that you do as a songwriter is you you have to find a way to give the songs to the people who are listening. Yeah. And then once you've done that, like it's not yours anymore. It's it's something that's theirs. And they may they may interpret it differently than you do. And they may feel it differently sure. than you do. Sure. And they may, you know, hold it in their heart in a different way than you do. But none of that is ever gonna happen if you can't sing them out loud. And you know, so it's it's this is really my biggest obstacle right now is I'm writing songs that are hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing songs that are true and that really, um, you know, I tear up just thinking about the songs sometimes, yeah. not even singing them. Um, but I, I need them to be in the world. And if I don't, I got to overcome that hurdle so they can be out there. Uh, I mean, I've heard a lot of other songwriters say once they put it out, it's not theirs anymore. Yeah. I don't know if there's a master class on how to do that. Maybe you should talk to some of the <laughs> other songwriters who've done it. Like, how do you do yeah, that? Yeah. Just ask them. Like, go well, out, go out. Yeah. Of there. Yeah. there are people, I, you know, one of my good friends from, way back from the Indie Girl tour back in 99 is Edie Carey. Hmm. And Edie. Later last year. I, I adore Edie. And Edie can write a song that makes me and the audience like become a puddle of tears. I am just ruined in the audience mm. because she's so able to tell a very raw, uh, honest take on, you know, these very difficult subjects. And she's, she's brilliant and she never tears up. Like I never see her lose it. And I, and I've talked to her, how do you do that? And she's like, I don't know. I just, I, she doesn't really have an answer. We're 80. What's your answer? Like <laughs> I need a solid answer. What the only thing that's worked for me is that I try to focus on technique. So I'm focused on actual singing technique okay. and like the feeling of the air going over my vocal cords and where I have to put my fingers. And, you know, like if I focus on technique, I usually do better. And then if I'm really losing it, even though I'm focusing really hard on technique, I have to find a word somewhere like in the room. You've got signs that say microphones, cables, used vocal mics. And so if I if I'm really losing it, I can look at microphones and focus really hard on microphones. Mm -hmm. But the risk you take is that you will sing microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the lyric and in the middle of it all, you'll be like microphones, cables, use vocal mics. You know, yeah, that sounds great. Rewriting the songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> There's no way to phrase this as a as a question. I'm just going to phrase it as a compliment. You have one of those voices that when I hear, I am calm. I'm happy. I'm. I feel. I don't know how to describe how I feel, but you have the voice that is is one for me that just does it for me. Right. I don't know how to say that any differently. So. I'm glad that you're here playing songs from this new record. And we talked a little bit about how the lesson was as a co-write, right? So yeah, yeah. Then, yeah uh, and most of the songs though that, that you sing, you've written yourself. And is that the right, same? And that's, that's true for everybody on the record. If okay. you're singing it, you are the primary writer on a Lucky Now's record. Um, the, the nice thing about the lesson was that we, we were, you know, kind of doing it as a co-write as a team. And then we had one line that we were struggling with. Hmm. And so my son Red wrote it. Oh, cool! And so that—that's the um, the line about the bullet taking flight. So cool. it's all co-writing credit. He gets he gets a there's a credit for him on nice the record. Job, and Brad. our son Aiden's has has a credit on Flyaway. So oh, 
Yeah. Pretty cool. Fan, <laughs> fan uh, one that you didn't write, I'm going to point out because maybe he's watching. Two Rivers. What the hell? Really? Oh. Like, just, there's something on there. I, I, actually, as I was listening to the song, when I got to a spot, I could do it because we know we're not supposed to play with our phones while we're driving. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard the first name Amandolin. Yeah. And it made me want to have a daughter so I could name her Amandolin because yeah. I just love like the interplay of the words. Like it's Mandolin. Right? A Mandolin, Mandolin. Amandolin, right? Oh wow. Yeah. Is that is that a is that his daughter's yeah, name? Yeah, that's that's um Mike and Karen, his beautiful, incredible wise, insightful wife, Karen. Um Karen's daughter, Amandolin. Okay. Uh, when when they married, Karen already had Amandolin and Mike came in as a stepdad figure yeah. to Amandolin and uh but that's a story that, you know, he, he should definitely tell if he wants to share it. But yeah. it's, um, you know, it's produced a lot of really interesting songs over the years. And she um, also was a beautiful writer and singer, too. Joe Pug could sing that song. I think I hear when I heard yeah. it, I was hearing Joe Pug sing it in my head, too. So that's that was to me, that's a compliment because the first time I heard him, I think, oh, here here is one of the the throne takers of the Dylan songwriting 100%, school. Yeah, I thought when I heard him. <laughs> I guess the the final question before we do another song: Any regrets about your music career? Any things you wish you hadn't done? Uh, covers you ha- you shouldn't have put on on your records, or covers you shouldn't have played in concert? Photo shoots you regret? <laughs> so, I mean, any any of these like things you've done? Like, ah. Oh, Here's what I've learned: um, When I was younger, I had a lot of regrets. As I've gotten older, and I've you know kind of moved through a music career differently, um, there really are no regrets. There there are only lessons. You know, and and I think that that's been really helpful to me to think about it that way, that there are things I might not do again. There are songs I might I might choose different songs if I were recording again now, Um, even knowing what I had at the time, like what was available to me at at each record. There are there are things that I I might have done differently, but um, I really, truly believe that everything happens for a reason. And so if it if it goes your way, great. And if it doesn't go your way, there's something to learn from that. And I like to learn, you know, whenever I run out of things to learn, I pick up something else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I need to continue to learn and grow and read and get out into the world and meet new people and, uh, you know, sit with other people's lives and see if some of them turn into songs. Um, But, you know, regret and worry and backward looking, stuff is just going to ruin your life and it's it's one of the most important things I've ever you know and sometimes struggle like everyone with it but I know for a fact that I am better if I'm thinking about what I'm thankful for nicely said would you like to do one more or shall we call it a day hmm. can I do a can I do an oldie <sighs> yeah of course you can is it your oldie yeah. Good. Because I don't I don't pay royalties to the other people. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, you mentioned the ghost song, and I thought, you know, oh, that's yeah. a fun one That is play. a good one. Maybe a little of the backstory, too, because it helps. I will. Um, into the microphone, though. <laughs> you, know, you prefer it when I'm talking to the mic as opposed to laying on the ground yeah, to pick no. up the pick I just dropped? Yeah, please. All right. You're a very picky fella. Picky, um, I get it. <laughs> so... Uh, John D. Lamb runs a songwriter's retreat, which is, it's a really good time. If you haven't been there and you're a songwriter, you should make your way there to Lamb's retreat. Uh, when you get there, John D. Lamb is going to give you a songwriting assignment. And I mean, we, as songwriters, we, we do this to each other. Sometimes we'll call somebody up and go, I got this great idea, but it's for you. <laughs> um, I know you can write this. And so at the time I had been living in Bay City, Michigan, and I'd gone through this I had run for office and it was a you know crushing defeat um and it was I felt very strongly that I'd sort of been good old boyed out of town you know like it was just one of those situations where they were not ready for a female to have anything at all um particularly one like me who was outspoken and um you know not willing to bow to whatever they told me to do so um, John went looking for a story that kind of mimicked that, and he found a great one that that Old City Hall, um, which is now a restaurant, but is the same building that stood even at the turn of the last century. Old City Hall is haunted by a ghost, and she was the favorite prostitute of all the powerful men at the turn of the last century, back when Bay City was a logging town, and. Um, it, it turned out over time that she, th- through her vocation, learned a lot of secrets that she probably 
uh, shouldn't have known. And if, if she had been less intelligent, she probably couldn't have put all the pieces together, but she was very smart. And so she started to figure out, you know, what was going on with that town and, you know, where the power was and where the trouble was and where the bodies were buried. And, you know, she just knew too much. And so once she, um, once the powerful men figured out that she had put all the pieces together, they buried her alive. Um, and so she haunts Old City Hall. They had taken her to the jail cells, which are still there in Old City Hall. If you go down there, you can go to the wine cellars, and that's the old jail cells. They locked her in there until she um, she kind of was in this deep sleep because she had narcolepsy. It's a long story. But she got into a, a deep narcoleptic sleep, and they just threw her in a coffin and buried her alive. So um, John Lamb being the wise and interesting human that he is was like I think that you can find a connection between what you just went through and what they put her through and you know Lamb's retreat the deal is you've got a week to do it right so here's a week to figure out where your connection is with this you know turn of the last century prostitute who was murdered in cold blood by the powerful men in town so yeah so it's called girl with no name and um it's a. Uh, I love to play this song, um, and I and I think that when you have when you feel connected to a song like that, the audience feels that too, and so there is, this is another one where people say, play the ghost song, right? <laughs> and I know they're talking about this one. <laughs> Craig. 
Cracked asphalt streets, layers of brick road and cobblestone meat. They've torn my trolley tracks out, took them down to the scrapyard and melted them down. And this broken town still haunted. Everybody knows Everybody knows Nobody sees Gencast of the Lucky Nows on Acoustic Alternatives, live from Grove Studios, and a song that is on the previous album. The new album is coming out very, very soon, maybe even by the time the video for this podcast is ready, because it was taking me a little longer to edit than the audio, because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of lining up to do. The new album is called Broken Homes and Hearts of Gold. The previous album, why am I drawing a blank on the name of the Rise. album? Rise. Rise. Yeah. Uh, chance to see the Lucky Nows exists at the Nor'easter Music Festival, full band on stage, but also leading up to the festival in Cummins, Michigan. Any other uh, planned Lucky Nows shows? Yeah, we're playing over in Remus, Michigan at the May Barn. Okay. Um, that is on the 15th of June. And we have we have a lot of things all summer long, so go out on out to theluckynows.com and it will all be up there. Solo Jen, July 25th. Solo Amy Petty, Jen. Sarah Sinjic, and uh, Jennifer Nagel. Yeah. That tour has a name. That's a tour. It's a one-stop yeah. show. Yeah, though. that's the Songs of Darkness and Light. Tell me about that. Yeah. So this is, Sarah Sinjic has been really wanting to do a show where, you know, the, we're all friends and she's been wanting to do a show together with us and um we just thought what an incredible opportunity for four powerhouse singer songwriters who are also all good friends and know each other's music to go out there and really shine together so um we cooked up the songs of darkness and light because sarah tends to write these you know just ray of light songs she has a couple songs that are sad but amy petty and i are kind of more known for our dark dark songs and jen nagley is the human embodiment of a sunbeam she is and i said her name she wrong. is nothing but delight i i adore her and whenever i am sad i put on jen nagley's christmas album because you can't listen to it and not immediately get happy oh. um so we we wanted to sort of showcase the ability to write sort of all over the map as women and we write differently but we write um you know we write songs that we all can connect to so it's really exciting for the four of us to get out and we're playing um we're playing the Ark on July 25th, and we're playing at the May Farm. We're going to go over to the May Barn as well uh, in August. So okay. Singing on each other's songs and harmonizing. Yeah, stuff. we're going to sing nice. some harmonies and play on each other's stuff. And Very cool. Got a couple rehearsals planned, and um, yeah, really looking forward to a chance just to get out and play some of the songs that I haven't played in a long time. Um, nice. You know, the Gen Cast songs that, like a Vagabond Heart, you know, some of the ones that I haven't thought about in a long time that. When, I, when you talk with your friends, they go, oh, you know the song I love. And then they say a song you haven't played in 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's definitely what's happening here. So they're, oh, you've got to play. And then they play a song that I haven't even thought about. So it's been, it's been so much fun to just reacquaint myself with my back catalog. Cool. Thank you so much for carving out time today and of talking course. about the new record, you talking about your me. life, talking about everything, and uh, always good to see you. Yeah. Grove Studios, thank you for, for making a, a podcast possible for me. I think in the last four years, had this not been part of my life, I would have a little more time on my hands, but I'd also have a lot less joy. So if you're a, a band or a musician that just wants to find a place to practice, make a lot of noise, if you're a DJ, you want to make a lot of noise, you got neighbors that are like, turn it down. This is the place <laughs> you come to. It's an Ypsilanti 24-7 operation. If you wanted to come at two in the morning, the rates are a little cheaper and you can get a keypad code to get come in and no one's going to stop you from doing your thing as loud as you want. So thanks to Grove Studios. 
And uh, I don't have another one lined up yet, but I'm always looking for the next opportunity. This one has been on the, when are we going to do a thing? When are we going to talk about your new record? So I'm glad it was able to be yeah, done. Yeah, and I really appreciate you giving me a chance to come talk about it. And of your questions are always so wonderful and insightful. And it's been lovely over the years just to be your friend in addition to having your support as a DJ. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for listening to Acoustic Alternatives. If you're new because you found me through the 27,000 people who've watched the Jeff Daniels video because of <laughs> Kelly Clarkson, thanks for sticking around this long. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening.